All right, guys, uh, we're back and we're talking about very specifically what we're going to talk about now is how we do an MCI and how we set up an MCI. Understand that we're going to be doing a lot of practice on this later in the course, but I have to give this to you initially so that you have an idea if you get out on one of these big incidences, how this thing works. Again, we're going to be going over this a lot more after we get through the ologies, okay? So I want you to make sure that you guys understand that is that this is to just, uh, to, to, it's kind of like we did pediatrics back in second semester. We're going to be doing PALS a little bit later, which is a little bit more intense. Okay. So let's talk about the EMS. Remember, uh, we're going to go back here to this, uh, to this slide back here and, uh, oops, not that one. Let's go back here. And we were talking about coming back to here about how we usually work in a standard uh, operation. You got your incident commander, the operations sections chief. Remember what I said that there was an EMS branch right here. Okay. So usually they'll go up again. That just depends on how big the incident is. If it's just EMS that's involved, we usually just stay with an operation section chief. If, if it's, we've got multiple agencies and we've got like fire concerns or extrication concerns, we'll break this up into the EMS branch. So we'll put a branch uh, manager here and then we'll have a triage unit treatment and transport okay that's how we're going to usually set up for this all right so let's get back to doo -doo -doo -doo, there we go so again after you get a commander in there i would say to start out with you're probably just going to have command and triage and then as the incident grows and you get more people there you can then assign a branch manager or an operations section chief to where you can start handling these different things okay as the incident grows your span of control must grow if the incident commander is having to do triage treatment transport landing zone um uh the entire operations part of it uh pio and uh safety officer look at this we're getting kind of close here okay well now i got two triage teams uh whoops guess what so start breaking that down. Well, I can break off the there. I can break off my command staff. Hey, I'm back down to a manageable span of control. These five guys I can take care of. This many I can't take care of by myself. Okay. So again, triage. Again, it's the first functional group. Uh, all personnel should be trained in the triage technique. Uh, and all of us should be, right? Uh, and we should understand that we got immediates, which are red delays, which are yellow, uh, minimal, which are greens and expectant. Those are our dead patients or we expect them to die. And then we should do that on the first pass. That's where our start triage comes in. But then that's the, the start of it that we come back around the second time. And, and remember that your secondary triage is ongoing and can change in the middle once you even get them to the treatment area so you could have a patient in the yellow treatment area that starts to go to the red or somebody in the green area that goes red so that is a definite possibility it does happen all right so start simple triage rapid transport it allows for the rapid sorting of patients does not require specific diagnosis and again it's uh really simple the start triage hey everybody that can hear me that can walk come on over and that's it they're greens all right they have good respiratory effort their pulses are good they have neurologic status we quickly check those on every patient when we wrap the little ribbon around we tie a green ribbon around them and we keep going all right again these are anybody that can do all these things despite injuries guess what they're a green okay if they can walk and come to you they're green and unless we see something that's dramatically if they're green but they're breathing 45 times a minute yeah, I might go, no, we, oh, why don't you, and I put the red tag on them and they go, hey, you, you go over to this way. All right. So, um, and by the way, that's despite injuries, by the way, we can reclassify them a little bit later if we determine that their situation's a little bit more peril than we thought. So if I got somebody that's walking over with an open abdominal wound and he's kind of holding his guts and going, oh, yeah, uh, I think I'm okay. Uh, they're not green, by the way. I would probably tie the red ribbon around them and go back there. Uh, so again, uh, but when start triage, by the way, the patient's not breathing, we're going to open their airway. If they're not, uh, if they don't, then guess what? They're dead. Uh, again, if they open their airway and they start to breathe, they are red at that point, tag them and go. By the way, uh, patients with a rest, uh, and the way that I remember this is RPM. 
If the respiratory rate's over 30, then it's red. If it's below 30, we go to the next assessment, which is the P. If they have a radial pulse, if they do have a radial pulse, then they're, uh, we go to the next one. If they don't have a radial pulse, we tag them red and we keep going. The last one is, is uh, ask the patient to grip both of your hands. If they can do that simple task they, and they can't still move, they're a yellow. If they cannot do, the, if they cannot do that simple task, it, they can't. So again, the, the little RPM is, a, uh, is again, respirations, pulse, uh, and also capillary refills in there. If they have a capillary refill that's greater than two seconds, uh, that's another test that you can do under the, the, the pulse or perfusion. And then mental status can do. 32 can do. Okay, if you can remember that, it's actually pretty good. All right. Now there, there's other or there's other ways to sort people to assault, uh, sort, assess life saving interventions and treatment transport, uh, not specific for any age group. This guy right here actually has a subset called Jump Start for the, the little kids. The only difference between Start and Jump Start, by the way, is your respirations. If the respirations are above 45 or below 15, then they're red. Uh, if they, you open their airway and they don't breathe, you give them five breaths. If they don't start breathing, that's where the point they become expected. Okay. And by the way, we are going to do multiple assessments of that. Uh, I will tell you that, uh, nobody uses hardly salt anywhere. Okay. Um, I will tell you that, uh, again, life-saving treatments, uh, uh the jump start is again for the, uh, it's, uh, it's paralleled to the, again, but it's for the pediatric, uh, uh, tool. Uh, let's see here. So tagging again, ribbons is our, usually our first line of tagging, and then we will switch to the actual triage tags. Okay. So the quick one is done with our ribbons. All right. If you don't have ribbons, you can still use tags. It's okay. Uh, but again, uh, you got to make sure that you, you, again, and the, the reason that we do the tagging or labeling is so that we don't re-triage the same patient five, six, several times. Okay. Uh, again, uh, they use the colored survey tape. Uh, they're very easy to use and it identifies your priorities. Okay. The idea, once you start moving these patients, the other thing that triage is actually responsible for is once you get everybody tagged is getting them to the treatment area. they become litter bearers. Okay. So that's the second job. Once you get everybody triaged, you start moving the patients, all the red tags first, uh, unless you can't get to the red tags because there's yellow and greens in front of them. But again, we try to get the reds out first, the yellow second, and the greens third. Triage tr is the French word for to sort. And the idea is, is we get the most salvageable patients that are the most serious so that we can do the most good. That's the whole purpose of doing the triage. Your triage should only take about 30 seconds. Guys, if you're spending more than 30 seconds on a patient, you're doing it wrong, okay? You're going to want to try to help them. This is not the time to do that. Again, this is about the overall saving of multiple people, okay? Uh, the morgue is the black tagged area. Usually we leave the black tags where we find them. Or if we do collect them in an area, we make sure that the media can't enter it. And the, so the bystanders can't enter it either. And again, if, uh, we cl work closely with the medical examiners. Actually, there's an actual team for that. DMORT teams will come in and actually do that. But, but most of the time, especially if it's a criminal scene, we leave the dead bodies where they're at so that the evidence guy can do their thing in order, in order to help catch the bad guys. Um, in most places they have a pre-existing plan for facilities and responders again uh uh they usually have a uh these guys are actually pretty coordinated uh and again clergy also help out in this area as well uh our treatment area again we get the patients where we can start working on them if you're gonna dump your equipment yeah this is probably a good place to start dumping your equipment okay and the reason that i say that is is because the the you're going to find out real quick that the resources start going really quick at this point. Okay. Uh, and you, your incident commander should be thinking ahead here about moving uh, equipment to a certain area so that it can be easily accessed by your crews and your staff. Okay. Uh, secondary triage can be done at this location. They can determine whether or not that you're doing okay, not okay. Uh, and again, there are some times you mistriage somebody. It happens or the patient deteriorates. It happens. 
So be ready for that, okay? Now, uh, again, we separate into functional treatment areas. Again, make sure that you've got the equipment that you're going to need. Again, if you're going to dump your equipment somewhere, great place to do it, okay? So again, your red tags, again, this is where the bulk of the medical resources are going to be. The yellows, again, is usually require uh, stabilization while you're waiting on transport, okay? And then, again, your green area, usually these guys, if you give them a little bit of equipment, they usually take care of themselves. Uh, I usually pick somebody that lo looks really responsible and go, hey, uh, can you start throwing some bandages on some people? Really simple. Tell them to hold their hand, tell you know, cover up a wound. Uh, it, it very little, it requires very little monitoring, but you do need one person. What you're going to find out with the green area is it's like herding cats. And matter of fact, they're going to try to walk off. I will tell you right now that during your incident that you do with us, oh yeah, we're going to have a few walking off or getting in the scene or, uh, yeah. And so you do need to assign one person to them in order to make sure that they, uh, what I call the cat herder. Okay. Um, so again, your, your treatment leader unit is responsible for the treatment group and their leader's job is to be extremely flexible in order to meet the needs of the people that are in there, okay? Uh, you guys, what you're gonna find out is, is, is it, when you get into these incidents, once the litter bearers start coming out with these patients, that's when you're probably gonna be overwhelmed the most. Start your casualty treatments in that area, okay? Communicate, you got to do really good communication with the incident commander to let them know, hey, these are the resources that I need, okay? Remember, once a real incident happens, you're going to have people coming out of the woodwork to come help you. Probably your biggest problem as an incident commander staging officer is corralling the responders to get them to the right spot in order to get them to do the most effective uh, job, Okay. Uh, On-scene physicians, uh, again, the great uh, support for EMS. They can do the medical oversight. They're great for the treatment area, okay? Absolutely great for the treatment area. Get them in there, okay? Staging, again, uh, allows for proper access, keeps everything from becoming congested, and you only bring in the crews that you do and don't need, okay? So, again, you can bring in other people to the scene via the staging area. It's kind of like that holding pin. Okay, we're going to let five more people in. Okay, I need six more people in treatment. Okay, I'm going to need uh, five more ambulances to come start doing transport. So this is where that, that staging area. Transport supervisor coordinates with the staging officer and the treatment supervisor. In other words, the treatment says, hey, I got 14 reds. Okay, well, we're going to start bringing in ambulances. You know what? I got a red that I can take, but we can put a green in the front seat. Okay? So, again, that's what they're there to do is determine who goes to the hospital. And they need to be flexible in determining the order of which that happens. Okay? Again, guys, we shouldn't be taking... If we got room, we can put greens in there, but you should only have one red patient for every ambulance, okay? Uh, a red and a yellow is sort of kind of okay. Uh, two reds in the same ambulance, that's a lot of resources. That's a lot of things to do. It's a lot of things. Only give them what they need to handle. But the other thing that the transport supervisor has to do is coordinate with the hospitals of how many they can take. Um, once And it's really important to let your hospitals know early that you've got a multi-patient situation. If I got an estimated 50 patients, can I take 50 patients to the local area hospitals and not uh, and exceed their disaster plans? Okay. By the way, if they call an internal disaster, which is what usually done, they bring everybody downstairs. They, they have plans at this at the hospital. Okay. Uh, pretty much it's all hands on deck. You know what? That meeting this afternoon to talk about, you know, which which uh, widget we're going to buy. Guess what? Canceled. Everybody downstairs. Okay. And so uh, you uh, consider specialty hospitals if you have them. Uh, again, I know that Ocala Regional is my trauma center. I'm going to be sending a lot of reds to my trauma center. But there is a finite number of people that they can take at that trauma center. Now, do I need to send them to other places? Okay. Not a big deal. In Marion County, we got we got three hospitals and in, in multiple uh, non uh, emergency departments that can handle it, uh, freestandings that can handle like your green and yellow patients. But do we have the resources? Let's say if I've got eighteen trauma alerts, no. 
that's the problem. So am I going to have to be flying some out? Am I going to have to be transporting some to different locations? Which again, extends my time for my turnaround to bring back my transport units. Okay. Now the good news is, is once a disaster plan is, is activated at a hospital, most of the time they can handle a quite amount, uh, a good amount of patients. What happens if we get a passenger car train that derails right in the middle of downtown Ocala? I got 700 patients. Uh, and I can tell you, I've actually lived this one, the Crescent City train wreck. Uh, yeah, we had 548 patients and we had uh, six ambulances in the county uh, that was in the county. Uh, I responded for Marion County as part of it. Uh, and I can tell you that we were an hour and 15 minutes away and we were still hauling freight once we got there. Okay. Remember, Crescent City is in the what I call the Bermuda Triangle of hospitals. Uh, Daytona's 45 minutes, Putnam's 45 minutes, St. Augustine's 45 minutes. Okay. So long and the short is, is that, yeah, your turnaround time there was horrid. Okay. Yeah. The train picked a great place to derail buddy and, and dump over 500 patients. All right. So your transport also use the triage tags. Again, this is where we, we catalog who went with what truck we use the number. Okay. Now we'll sort that rest of that out later. And by the way, if you get that poor job, if you're on light duty, uh, bless you, you're going to need it, okay? But that's where you're going to match up the triage tag with the, the, the triage priority, age, gender, major issues, and the transporting unit where they're going to the departure time. And if you can get it, the patient's name. <coughs> um, extrication, that can be a, a branch or group in there, but usually that's above your EMS part. They, they, do, their, they do their thing. They're not there to take care of patients. They're there to rescue victims. They don't become a patient until they get rescued. Then they become and decontaminated. And then they will become a patient. Okay. Your rehab unit again provides uh, uh, support for responders, food, water, medical. Uh, they regularly rotate and uh, thermal control. Again, uh, the 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 train wreck. I will tell you, you got around 90, 95 degrees out there. After working in that for about six hours, yeah, you were you were spent. Okay, so again, you, they they need to shelter these guys and keep them rested and hydrated. Okay, so that becomes a real interesting part for your for your operations chief is rotating these folks in and out so that again they don't become ill or they don't become fatigued or or start having issues. All right, um, there is not a IMS incident debrief, a formal debriefing, a, a written debriefing that I have read that has ever said, man, the communication was freaking awesome. I can't believe that they communicated so well. Matter of fact, it's usually the number one bullet point of things to improve on. Communication should have been better. Boy, uh, yeah, that is the truth. Um, you need to keep the unnecessary radio traffic down, okay? And then key up your radio before transmitting and make sure nobody else is there. And you guys, unfortunately, are going to learn that the hard way when things start getting crazy, okay? Again, plain English, you want to use, don't use command groups. Again, use common radio terms so that you understand. And they use the respect the lines of communication. Don't use comms for something that that's not that you can do face to face okay uh work closely again uh the ems communication officer uh they work closely sometimes we actually have to bring communications to the scene based upon how big the scene is uh mobile command centers actually have their own dispatch so that we don't have to burden the rest of the dispatch system with that because again in in communications i can tell you with the mci kicks off uh, you watch, and that dispatcher will either make or break your incident, okay? I will tell you that from personal experience, I've been on both ends of it. A great dispatcher makes your day wonderful. A horrible idiot dispatcher makes your day incredibly, incredibly bad. And I will tell you right now, from the dispatch point of view, when they say MCI, you just kind of hang your head. You send the supervisor to go get you three cups of coffee because you're going to need it, okay? It's, it's going to be nothing but pounding intensity for as long as that incident goes, guys. It, it is, I will tell you, I've been the dispatcher for multiple incidents, 
Uh, it is crazy. Okay. Uh, disaster management. Again, these are used at high impacts events. Uh, they, again, in mitigation, we deal with the mitigation. Okay. Planning recovery response is the, is the rest of, of it. Um, we deal with the, the mid, I'm sorry, we don't deal with mitigation. We deal with the response part of it. We're, once it happens, we take care of that. Okay. But again, the mitigation is delimited in the first place. Okay. Uh, you know, that's an example, early warning systems, uh, planning is, Hey, if we do have this, what is it we're going to do? If the college of central Florida has a mass casualty shooter, how are we going to handle this? Where are we going to go in at? What are we going to stage at? Where are we going to locate our units at? Okay. And I will tell you right now, those plans are drawn up. Uh, we have people that are, that is their job in life is to make these plans. Okay. Your, your management, your, your emergency management, that's what they spend a priority of their time doing. By the way, do we adjust those plans based upon the incident? You bet we do. Okay. Um, and again, responses, what we do, we go in there, we follow our IMS guidelines and then the recovery, as soon as we make sure that we return the department of jurisdiction community to normal, and then we start rebuilding, we start reunion the families, follow up care, uh, rebuilding process. That is that part of it. Okay. Um, and again, common problems that we have is lack of recognizable EMS command in the field, uh, failure to provide adequate rights, sped notification, uh, yeah, we're really bad at that, actually. How do I get additional responders in? Can I call in additional responders? Okay. Um, failure to provide a proper triage. And again, lap of a initial stabilization of the patients. And I will tell you that it's all, uh, it's all based upon how you got. Uh, overly time-consuming patient care. Basics. Keep them alive. Get them to the hospital where there's plenty of people to help them. Okay. Improper, inefficient use of infield personnel and improper distribution of medical care facilities. Yeah, one of the biggest problems you have is stacking up 82 trauma patients at Ocala Regional while Advent got four patients. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a bad thing. Okay, so relocating those and allocating that, that's what that transport officer is supposed to do is, is distribute those patients to get the right patients to the right levels of care. And again, that's, that's an art form, not a, not a science. Okay. That really is. And that can change based upon the entire incident and what's going on there. Okay. Uh, we're going to be using our vest, so I'm not going to go into too much of that. Uh, the lack of drills, uh, that's why I'm really insistent on, we're going to do a full scale drill because I think that that's how you learn is getting there, see how you did and then doing it again so that you can correct the problems that you had, okay? Um, we're gonna do tabletop drills, by the way, before. Uh, I've got a whole grant for you guys so that we could do tabletop drills and we can work out wrinkles that as you guys are learning the process, okay? And it's so very important when you get a chance to take a part of these drills to do so, okay? Even if it's just a simple tabletop of a traffic crash, Guys, that is great training, okay? Because then when you get to the real thing, you're going to know how you want to do it, okay? So I can't stress it enough. Guys, do that, okay? Please do that. Um, again, uh, mental services, uh, again, the on-scene providers, no specialized training, uh, no cycle. Again, they meet basic human needs of these people. And, and it's so very important because we're actually pretty good as, we're, as far as we're in the incident. Once we start to slow down, that's when everything starts to hit, okay? And we got to remain available, okay? And again, these these resources are actually available uh, after the incident is probably when you're going to need them the most, okay? So again, it might be a week or two week. Uh, we usually, usually do on a big incident a defusing um, where we basically talk it over, make sure everybody's going to be okay. Two to three days later, we actually do a full-scale uh, debriefing of it and then an act an after action review is, uh, is kind of a moderated one about a, uh, 10 days to a week after we gather some data uh, uh, somewhere in there we usually uh, you know a, a formal debriefing on your bigger incidents I will tell you that they usually provide a, a, a actual they do an actual investigation to say hey this one went really good and maybe this one didn't go so well and this is things that you can improve on okay um, I'm going to stress this last point. We play as we practice. And that's why you guys are going to be doing a full-scale drill barring Omicron doesn't kill us or 
whatever the pandemic of the week is. We're going to do a full-scale drill, okay? Whether it be with just tags or my plan is to do it with the real live patients being the EMT students, okay? Um, that's the way I want to do it, and that's the way I'm hoping that we get to do it. So uh, you play like you practice. So when we're doing these practices, make sure that you participate. Make sure that you know the job of, of a treatment officer, that you know the job of a transport officer, the incident commander, the safety officer. Yeah, that's right. You've got to know how to do these things, okay? Now, a good incident commander, by the way, knows the strengths and weaknesses of the people around them, okay? A bad incident commander um, will put somebody in a job that they know that they can't handle, okay? Now, again, at some point, you got to be able to handle all the jobs, okay? And that's why we're going to train. And that's why we're going to get better at doing that. So when you do get out there, you don't look like a buffoon, okay? That you're actually able to do the maximum amount of help to people. And that's what we're after. All right, that's it for the IMS. We are going to do tons more practice on this. I have scheduled a lot of it. So don't worry about that. This is the kind of a, we're dipping our toe in the cold water don't worry, we're going to jump head first in sooner than you think. So guys, I'll see you all in the next one.